Today's podcast is brought to you by Sprizzy. Looking to skyrocket your YouTube channel's growth? Meet Sprizzy, your video's ultimate matchmaker. Their tailored ad campaigns connect your content with viewers who are already looking for videos like yours. With Sprizzy, you're not just getting views, you're gaining subscribers who are genuinely interested in what you create. Are you ready to boost your reach? Visit Sprizzy.com today and let's launch your channel to new heights. Sprizzy, the smarter way to promote your YouTube channel. Patrick Darms and your co-host Anton Paras here joining us is a return guest who is most welcome back Nathan Perry Nathan hey guys. pleasure to be here love being on the pod and excited to talk about the movie we have today oh my goodness Nathan has been too long we are so excited to have you yeah it has been a while this is a very special episode for a couple different reasons number one this is our first patreon request episode Mm -hmm. number two this is the first time we are covering a film that we have already covered troy way back in season one we covered troy that was episode number 14 for us anton and this is going to be episode 104 so it has been a while yeah the show's changed a little bit since then i think we've really figured out a good momentum and rhythm of things yeah, we have. And of course, the, the very nature of the Patreon makes this unique because, you know, we had talked about the possibility of revisiting films that we had done in the early seasons of the podcast. Right. This was probably one that we would have eventually gotten around to redoing because, number one, it was a really interesting movie to talk about the first time. Number two, this was one of our most popular episodes. So what are we doing here? Well, this is a very obvious thing. We didn't have a guest on when we first talked about Troy. So we're going to try to bring something new to the table, some kind of fresh point of view. And Nathan, that's where you come in. Oh, I'm happy to bring it. We'll see what uh, what kind of comes out of this discussion. I think we see similarly on a number of things, but I'm excited to see where we might differ and have some some interesting stuff. Awesome. Anything that you want to share or plug as our guest today? Oh, just I'm hoping everybody has a great fall. That's when we're recording this and hopefully it comes out in that same season and, you know, just uh, excited to be here with you guys. Well, the pleasure is all ours. Yeah, no, this episode is probably going to release, I think, the week or two before okay. Thanksgiving. So we're getting so. in right there at the end of fall. I like it. Yeah. Well, without further ado, I will intro this for us. Loosely based on Homer's The Iliad, this epic historical war film portrays the war between the ancient kingdoms of Troy and more or less Sparta, but it's Greece. While visiting Spartan King Menelaus, Trojan Prince Paris falls for Menelaus' wife, Helen, and takes her back to Troy. Menelaus's brother, King Agamemnon, having already defeating, defeated every army in Greece, uses his brother's fury as a pretext to declare war against Troy, the last kingdom preventing his control over the Aegean Sea. Achilles, a Greek hero widely considered the greatest warrior ever born, fights for Agamemnon but deeply despises him. Troy was released on May 14th, 2004 by Warner Brothers Pictures, Helena Productions, Latina Pictures, Radiant Productions, Plan B Entertainment, and Nymar Studios. Directed by Wolfgang Peterson, the screenplay was written by David Benioff, again, inspired by Homer's The Iliad, starring Brad Pitt, Eric Bana, Orlando Bloom, Diane Kruger, Brian Cox, Sean Bean, Peter O'Toole, Brendan Gleeson, Rose Byrne, and Anton's favorite actor, Garrett Hedlund. The budget was $185 million, that is $307 million adjusted for inflation, and the box office revenue was $497 million, that is $826 million adjusted for inflation. 
Well, we already know why this movie was chosen, right? This is by Patreon request. Our patron, Daniel, made a, a very impassioned case for this to be the first film that we revisited. But Nathan, as today's guests, or I should say as today's guests, because you're only one person, when I offered you a couple different films you know, that you could appear on, what made you interested in Troy? Well, it's uh, one, I do like the Iliad. I'm not like a huge, oh my God, I can recite it or anything like that. But, you know, Greek myth, history, something is, you know, I've got a passing interest in. I have seen this as a film that's always been in the background as like, oh, Troy, that was a big film. Never got a sense of it's a flop, but not a super big success. So it's always been kind of like an intriguing epic kind of sitting out there, hanging out there. And um, I remember also, frankly, you guys covering it not too long ago and me being like, oh, that sounds like there's, if not something super, you know, super memorable about it, at least it's got, it's got something there to discuss, right? It's not a complete, like, it's not a thing to suffer through, but it's also not the the best thing ever. And thus it sits in a weird middle ground and seemed for that reason, intriguing to get into. Yeah. This was your first experience with it, right? You did not I've see never it seen it before. I didn't know who the cast was other than Brad Pitt, because he's on every single, you can't see a a, a still or a, a card for this movie without seeing Brad Pitt on it. I didn't know um, it really any of its production history or anything. I just said, let's, let's go. And uh, was, um, yeah, we definitely got some stuff to talk about. Yeah. Quite a bit of notes mm -hmm. on this. And I saw this in mm -hmm. the theater when it came out, probably with the wrong expectations. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people, I had gladiator on my mind. Mm -hmm. Gladiator was such a huge movie when it came out a few years before this. And it really, you know, rekindled Hollywood's interest in sword and sandal epics. You know, they were very big in the 1950s mm. and uh, the beginning of the 1960s, but they had really fallen out mm. of favor. Gladiator changed that. This movie, I remember it being hyped up as the next Gladiator. The expectations for it were really big. You know, Brad Pitt is still one of the biggest stars in the world. Back then, I would say he was like one of the five biggest, you know, maybe him, Tom Cruise, Will Smith. I'll put Russell Crowe in there in the early 2000s for sure. I'm probably forgetting someone, Anton, feel free to chime in. But he, he would have been in the conversation as biggest movie star in the world at the time. Orlando Bloom? Uh, sure. Yeah. If, if you say so. <laughs> I mean, why would they cast him in this movie? Uh, it was a great point. Yeah. They, they really wanted him to work for sure. All joking aside, Orlando Bloom was a pretty big name at the time. There's no getting around that. As was Eric Bana, who is an actor that a lot of people could probably forget now. Mm. But he was fresh off of, you know, the, just the disaster that was Ang Lee's Hulk. And this was a year before he would be in Steven Spielberg's Munich. But Eric Bana was a big rising star at the time. He was a big indie star, right? Because he played uh, in that Chopper film. Yeah. In that was a, I think yeah, yeah 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 that makes sense and then of course he he got a big breakthrough in Black Hawk Down and then yep. you know I know you like Hulk a little bit more than I do but that was a huge break for him it was a it was a big movie at the time yeah people said hey that's a name that we'll recognize now for the worst yeah. reasons yes and the other part of this Wolfgang Peterson we're going to talk about him a little bit later but Anton we actually covered one of his films just a couple weeks ago Air Force One yes. Nathan, are you familiar with Peterson? No, I mean, I did look him up a little bit after, you know, in part of uh, looking up things about this film. I don't think I've seen really anything. And certainly I've recognized a lot of movies from that he's done. Uh, das Boot, uh, was it Poseidon and other things in between? <laughs> um, never, never Ending Story. I guess, okay, I have seen Never Ending Story, but. 20 plus years ago, something like that. I don't think anything else I've really been um, been exposed to. He was a name back then for sure. Very competent mm -hmm. action director who directed some really big movies. I mean, you named a couple of them. You know, Air Force One, obviously. The Perfect Storm was a big movie. That would have been the one that he did right before mm -hmm. Troy. Anton, did you see this in the theater? Because I don't even remember what you said, what you, how you answered that question when I asked you when we first covered this. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and just defer to say things about Garrett Hedlund, if that's okay. Feel free. All right. Well, 
Uh, Garrett Headland, I wrote these down. Garrett Headland doesn't have to worry about a zombie apocalypse because they only eat brains. <laughs> Of another. Garrett Hedlund looks like he'd be a model for depression. Very photogenic. Garrett Hedlund uh, moved people to tears with his performance in this film, mainly very, because very they specific. thought he was portraying an onion. Garrett Hedlund looks like a mentally challenged broccoli. You got more? Or- oh, yeah, I do have more. Save him, save uh, him. We can do- <laughs> don't don't yeah. use them all now. What, just one last one. Garrett Hedlund would give me a nasty look, but he already gives everyone one. Soldiers obey. So uh, that's my connection to this film. So theater, no, yeah. No, okay. did not see this in theaters. <laughs> okay. I was disappointed when I saw this in the theater. Probably like a lot of people, unfairly comparing it to Gladiator. I'm like, well, that wasn't as good as Gladiator. Therefore, this movie stinks. Mm-hmm. I've seen it a bunch of times since. We obviously covered it way back in season one. Both of us were much more favorable on it than its reputation would have you think. I remember the word of mouth being very bad about it. It has a 53% Rotten Tomatoes score, which is, you know, not great. It has this reputation as well as being a box office bomb, which it really wasn't. It was just so enormously expensive to make that I think that's how that came about. I mentioned the Sword and Sandal revival a little bit. It was released the same year as King Arthur and then Oliver Stone's Alexander also. uh, That's a film that we're going to be covering, Anton also produced by Warner Brothers. That was a major failure. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking the movie wasn't bad upon initial release and being much more fond of the director's cut, which, as we always say, does not count. No, it doesn't. But we are recommending it. If anyone has not seen the director's cut of this film, it's a big improvement. It really is. It's a bit longer, but a lot of the things that we talk about, whether it be feeling like certain scenes were held back, not enough development for certain characters. They fix a lot of that in the director's cut. I don't think I wrote this down, so I want to mention this now before I forget. This is one of those movies where you, you watch it and you're kind of amazed it's rated R. It's an R-rated movie that has, a, it just has like PG-13 level R-rated violence, if that makes sense. That there's nothing in it. It's a real soft R. There's just enough that you, I can see why it's an R, because the violence is a bit more graphic than just a straight up. Oh, no, no, no. I, yeah. I, I understand why it's rated R. But remember when we were talking about, like, Terminator 3? We're like, this is rated R? Like, this is real soft. That one's a joke. And that's actually just more because of the language in the film, right? Right. There's no language in this and there's film no at language all. In this film. It's just uh, probably, I would have to guess that hurt the box office performance of it a bit. I don't think that kids were going to go see this either way. So I don't know but, if that would have affected the box office. Well, it's it's a curious thing. I couldn't find any information about this in the like making of, but you know, most studios would push for the PG-13 mm-hmm. and without any profanity in it, you have to think with a couple of edits this could have been made PG- PG-13 yeah. and it wasn't and it's a curious decision on their part not to do it. I think it's more so to be competitive to any comparative films like gladiator being rated yeah. r not that necessarily made a ton of money. and that made yeah. a ton of, so i don't think that it's necessarily holding it back being rated r i think the film itself just held itself back mm. i just want to uh, echo though that that's a very interesting an interesting thought because i think going into the film just knowing about the rating and you know gladiator and things like that i was expecting a different film than than we got and it's i want to agree patrick that even though i saw it decades after its release almost actually over 20 years after its initial release i still also brought certain expectations that oh it's going to be uh it's going to look a certain way it's going to feel a certain way it's going to have dialogue or it's going to have visual effects that are going to be a certain way because this is what you do when you're making a kind of a sword and sandals and epic history kind of movie in this way. And yeah, definitely I expected that R rating to be leaned into more, not something that almost felt like, I guess it's there kind of thing. So, but yeah, we'll definitely. It's just, it's soft. It's very soft because you could on paper read some of the rating reasons, but when you actually look at the film, it's like, well, it's not really getting there. So what's the goriest thing in the, the film? Gorious? I, I, yeah. What's the goriest thing in the film? Maybe when he kills Hector? Um, I like, don't even know if I would say that's the goriest. The goriest is either um, yeah. Hedlund's get, neck getting cut. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, probably, yeah. I think that's there, probably it. He's like gasping for air. It wasn't nearly as bloody, but it also doesn't have cuts away like when Achilles like stabs the guy through kind of in the neck or 
Oh, that was so beginning. cool. That was so cool. So and bad. After ass. getting a spear in the upper shoulder is definitely not feeling like you know, a lot of people get get sorted to the chest and it's like, I okay, that's that's cool. I wonder if there were but it got it must have gotten re edited because I know the director's cut has more violence as well as also more other Way other more. You, you see, you see limbs yeah. getting hacked off and stuff. It's way also, more. I believe it has more sexual content, if I'm, or at least more visual content in that way, from what I heard. It sure so, does. If you like Diane Kruger, you will enjoy okay. the director's cut. That's all so. I'm say. I don't know if there was something residual left over from that that influenced the rating, or they were aiming for that, but then decided to pull out at the last minute. I don't know. You know what? I'm going to say it. They half-assed mm. it. Like, it's already rated R. Just make it a real R movie. I don't know. I don't know why we're talking about this this much. It is kind of interesting, though. It is very interesting. Also, some of the visual, you know, feeling choices, right? I know. Anyway, we're getting off. Maybe we need to keep on that. We'll get there. All I got to say is, Pat, uh, re-recording or revisiting new topics, you got it. Yeah. It's like, we didn't talk about Mm -hmm. this the last time, I don't think. Uh No. I don't think so. I, I listened to it and I don't I don't remember you guys covering that. So I do think that is interesting. Is it worthy of its R rating? And I don't I don't think I certainly don't think the theatrical. Yeah, I would no. say no. Nope. It, it's a what's a what's a what's a good way to sum it up? It's a waste of an R rating mm-hmm. in my opinion. All right, production history. So just like in the first episode, there is a lot of really good production information from a Vanity Fair article written on this film in 2019 by Johanna Desta. Writer David Benioff, who would later go on to gain infamy by being the showrunner for the HBO series Game of Thrones, he was a big fan of the Iliad as a child. After he wrote the screenplay for the Spike Lee film 25th Hour, he proposed to Warner Brothers that he attempt a screenplay version of the Iliad. Now, there are major differences between Homer's Iliad and this film, the main one being the 12 Greek gods. They play a major role in Homer's poem. They are completely absent from this film. In the poem, neither Menelaus nor Agamemnon die. That's probably the other biggest difference, I would say. Uh, Achilles' death is foretold, but it does not occur in the Iliad, which leaves the Trojan War unresolved. He does die in the war in many related works by other authors. Uh, Ajax Telamon also survives the Iliad. There are two Ajaxes in the poem, if I recall correctly. But in related literature, he dies by his own hands shortly after Achilles' death. I'm really relying on my memory of uh, working for me here because I have not read the Iliad since high school. (laughs) And then, of course, the Trojan War in the poem, it lasts about 10 years and the events depicted in this film I'm just going to take a guess. It seems like a couple weeks, it in at, although hard to tell. It in a, a, probably, if you do a literal days, like probably just under three weeks, which I think was a real interesting choice. And also, I think it was just a little note. I may need to want to go and compare. I thought the Netflix description actually mentioned 10 years in it. So it's even conflicting with the actual content that the uh, film. Oh, yeah, that's that can't be right. I think that it's just probably someone wrote a description that wasn't familiar with the content of the film and just (laughs) said, oh, if it's about the Trojan War, it's got to be 10 years. Uh, Overall, the Iliad is the account of the feud between Achilles and Agamemnon. Not all of the romantic elements that we see in the film are as prominent in the poem. Here's a cool bit. This is a nice what if. Christopher Nolan was offered the opportunity to direct this when it was in its very early stages of development. Wolfgang Peterson was originally in talks to direct Batman vs. Superman, but after meeting with David Benioff, the two clicked and he became interested in this. Batman vs. Superman ended up getting shelved, but Nolan was given the green light by Warner Brothers to direct Batman Begins. I thought that was really interesting. Because I think this would have been great if Nolan had done it, but... I'm very glad we got Batman Begins. I think that worked out for everyone. Yeah, I much prefer that. Peterson had been offered the chance to direct Gladiator years before, but he turned it down, and his regret over this decision was another reason why he wanted to do Troy. We already talked about Peterson a bit during the intro. Probably not a name that a lot of average moviegoers are familiar with, but he really has done some great stuff. Das Boot is one of the greatest films I've ever seen. It's one of the best war movies ever made, and if anyone hasn't seen it, Give it a watch. It's a great movie. So Brad Pitt's involvement in this film was 
really, really early on. I couldn't find a lot of casting what if information in terms of who else was going to play Achilles. He trained for six months to get a body that looked like Greek statues. He even quit smoking for this role. It really seemed like he was the top choice. Now, for the role of Helen, they considered Halle Berry, Kira Knightley, Kristen Kruick, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, Jennifer Lopez, Sophie Marceo, Connie Nielsen, and Catherine Zeta-Jones. The studio really, really wanted Nicole Kidman, but Wolfgang Peterson insisted on an unknown actress, and that is how Diane Kruger was chosen. Pretty big year for her. She was in this and the, the first National Treasure movie in the same year. Not bad. Yeah, making good money. Yeah, yeah. She's had a pretty good career, too. This was not... Nathan, you made the point about this earlier before we started recording. There's really no one and dones for many actors in here. They all had careers. Yeah, I know the number of people this is looking at the cast list was like, oh, this is the first thing they were ever in. And uh, there was a lot of... Uh, as I kept saying while watching this movie, like a lot of babies in it, like a lot of, oh my gosh, this person looks like a baby. Um, essentially. Yeah. Even, even Garrett oh, Hedlund. He looks I like, mean, um, this was his yeah, this first was movie? movie. This is his first movie. And I think he, so. He had, right. He had quite a career. I think he's working at Trader <laughs> Joe's now. Is that who that was? Oh, <laughs> Garrett Hedlund. There's a, a spill on aisle seven, Garrett Hedlund. Oh man, I have to go clean that spill now. I sure hope they call me back for the next Is Tron that movie. How you think he talks? I, I would rather have him in the next Tron ro- movie over Jared Leto. Is that who's supposed to be in it? Yes. Yeah. So, oh no. I already know we're going to be covering that on the podcast because that ain't going to be good. The, the city of Troy was built on the island of Malta. Other important scenes were shot in Melina, a small town in the north of Malta, and on the small island of Camino. Not the planet from Attack of the Clones, yeah. <laughs> but that's an island in the Mediterranean. Uh, the outer walls of Troy were built for the cost of $1 million, and they were filmed in Cabo, San Lucas, Mexico. No CGI here, and you can tell. It looks yeah. pretty cool. Uh, maybe. We'll see if there's a different spot to put it in, but I do so appreciate a lot of the physical set building for this film. That's like one of those things that when think also going into this movie, didn't realize that it was pre the just glut of we just CGI everything in. Um, So seeing the physicality of so much stuff is cool. And it's cool how noting here about how it's built and constructed. So I'm sure we'll talk about that more later. But gosh. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a really good point. They, they spent the money. And I'm just going to guess they spent $25 million on sand. I mean, the whole movie's basically filmed on a beach. Yeah, for the most part. Principal photography took place from April to December of 2003. The battle scenes were filmed in Cabo and involved up to 4,000 extras. Marine biologists had to be on hand to make sure production didn't damage the area's endangered turtle population. Anton, do you want to finish the rest or do you want me to keep going? It's good to care. Please, please continue. Okay. Production was delayed by Hurricane Marty. Sets were destroyed and had to be rebuilt. And once the crew was able to return to Cabo, it was December, which meant the sun was going down earlier, which meant the natural lighting looked completely different than it had previously. And part of the CGI budget then had to be spent correcting this by getting long shadows, quote, taken out of basically every shot, end quote. I found that hilarious. And that was probably annoyingly expensive to do. Composer Gabriel Yarid was hired by Peterson and worked on the score for over a year. Test audiences reacted negatively, calling it, quote, overpowering and too big, old fashioned and dated the film, end quote. In a bizarre move, the studio fired Yarid without even giving him a chance to fix his work. Here's a new bit that I dug up for this revisited Mm -hmm. episode gentlemen james horner talked about being first approached by warner brothers to rescore the film i'm just going to say this it's worth listening to the interview in its entirety Mm -hmm. james horner gave no shits about offending anyone Mm -hmm. in this interview and i now want to hear more interviews with james horner because he didn't give an f he said quote i don't even know how to describe how atrocious the music was it was like a 1950s hercules movie and it wasn't because gabriel's not a gifted writer it's because he just doesn't have any knowledge of writing film scores real film scores like that and it was like it was so corny it was unbelievable and apparently it made the audience laugh in places during serious Mm -hmm. scenes end quote yeah just blasting by the way, Gabriel Yarrett is like an Academy Award winning film composer. So like he obviously does know how to score a film, but not according to James Horner. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, it's actually lo- like the interview is pretty lengthy and he says a lot more. I just I just took the mm. best part. Horner was hired and given less than two weeks to complete a replacement score, which he did. And around the time of the film's release in theaters, Yared br- ma- briefly made portions of his rejected score available on his personal website, which was later removed at the request of Warner Brothers. You can find bootleg versions today on YouTube. Trivia time. With a budget of $185 million, this was at the time of the release the third most expensive movie ever made unadjusted for inflation. Which two films cost more? Cleopatra. I said unadjusted for inflation, so no. I listened to the podcast where I re-listened to your previous, or I listened to your previous Troy episode, so so I know. know. I'm really interested if Anton can remember because he said Cleopatra last time. And was also wrong. <laughs> Did he really? That's one, so funny. Anyone. Time is a flat circle. Yes. Uh, hey, on. Un- yeah. Unadjusted. Unadjusted mm-hmm. for inflation. Um, we're gonna go Star Wars. No. 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 Yeah. No. I need one. Um, we already talked about one of them actually in this recording. Mm-hmm. We mentioned it. I feel like you probably said that in the original recording. I'm sure I did. Yeah. Terminator Three. Yes, and I remember. Mm-hmm. And Titanic. Yeah. It's a lot of money. Here's a nice little trivia extra bit for you, Anton. Within a couple months, this would get eclipsed by Spider Man 2, which cost $200 million. Good times. I know. Yeah. And that's 2004, a, they were just making I mean, it. It's a, but that's a such. I mean, they had to animate all of those arms for Dr. Ock. So he did. Well, I have to say, we're going to talk about it more when we when we get into the the production discussion of this. But I don't feel like they wasted the budget on this movie. I actually I can see where the money went. Mm-hmm. Yeah, all that sand. Yeah. Well, when you're filming stuff with four thousand extras, nope. that's not cheap. Well, they paid half of them half what they paid the others. <laughs> they also just I. I do like seeing all of the extras in the fight scenes because it's clearly it's clear they're just grabbing anyone. Because if you look at the peripheries, you can see like what I'm sure were kids just thrown in armor because it, it looks like there's 12 year olds out there. Like, but yeah, anyway, you got to spend money to to fill out that much. So, yeah, you do. Look, I'll take that over bad CGI oh my any day. I'm Take that, take that over uh, mm-hmm. Hobbit, Battle of the Five Armies. No. Just like the same elf over and over and over. No, I was thinking. I, I, we said this so many times, Anton. I, I am dreading having to cover those films. Um, I really am. Doing Hobbit movies? Yeah. We're going to have to. Going to have to. We're going to have to go over the bad guy that was the one orc made out of marshmallows. Okay, yeah, sure. Are you guys going to Azog or whatever? Your, is are you going to rank the dwarves by uh, favorite? least to most that would be the more normal the looking they are the more i hate them because there's a lot of dwarves in, in the book and in the that film the more the more book accurate looking dwarves i think okay. were the best ones i i would say uh, outside of the star wars prequels those three hobbit films are the most disappointing movies i've ever seen in my mm-hmm. life well we'll save that that's a teaser teaser for the fans they get to experience that yeah well that's the production history before we get into the discussion we will take a brief break as we hear from a sponsor today's podcast is brought to you by sprizzy looking to skyrocket your youtube channel's growth meet sprizzy your video's ultimate matchmaker their tailored ad campaigns connect your content with viewers who are already looking for videos like yours with sprizzy you're not just getting views you're gaining subscribers who are genuinely interested in what you create are you ready to boost your reach Visit sprizzy.com today and let's launch your channel to new heights. Sprizzy, the smarter way to promote your YouTube channel. All right, gentlemen, time to talk. Troy, why wasn't it better? I would like to start with the writing and the characterization. David Benioff wrote this film. I'm not a big Game of Thrones guy. I haven't seen all of it. I've only seen a couple of seasons, but I do see some similarities between the two. Mm -hmm. One of the things that makes Game of Thrones so interesting is that very few characters are completely good Mm -hmm. or bad. Here we have one, I would say, bad character, right? Agamemnon. He is like the clear villain of this film. Mm -hmm. Would we agree with that? He's he's the one who's uniformly characterized in a negative way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Traditionally, in a sense, very much uh, every scene, he's doing something with a sinister intention. 
he's bloodthirsty. He's a warmonger. He's hamming hmm. it up. He doesn't really ha- he doesn't really appear to have empathy for anyone. Sure. Yep. Doesn't trying to figure out the proper succession for his kids. Doesn't even have kids, as far as we can tell. <laughs> uh, and then I would say Hector is clearly the quote unquote best character in the film. He's the one with the best intent. If Agamemnon is the one with the worst, then Hector is the one with yeah. the best. Most, Most honorable. And, and consistently yes. good and consistently like positive traits, right? He doesn't even really make mistakes. Or if he makes a quote bad choice, it's for family or something like that. You know what I mean? Sure. Right. He has to stand up for mm-hmm. Paris all the time. To stand up for his little brother. Yeah. Every other character I would describe as some variation of neutral. Uh, I think many of them, I'm going to jump in and say, I think all of them are more flawed in different ways, right? Even if they're like, their intentions seem to be noble, they have more flaws, or they have negative characteristics that are more um, giving them some inability to achieve what they want to achieve, if that's a more vague way of describing it. No, no, I, I, I think I completely agree with you. I think that one of the issues with this film is all of the rest of the characters are giving very limited mm-hmm. screen time to really explore mm-hmm. any of their intentions or motivations. I would say apart from Achilles, who who has an arc, sort of. Yes, sort of. Sort of. Yeah, um, yeah, he cares, really doesn't really care. The most arc of any character in this film and is the most, quote, dynamic character. I, yeah, there's just not enough space for any of these characters. Again, we're going to probably repeat this a couple times, Anton, but the uh, the director's cut does address a lot of that. It does. You get a bit more, again, on the motivations of each character, especially Peter O'Toole's character, more depth into the Helen of Troy. So Right. Yeah. But the movie was already pretty long as is, so can't Too really many do characters? That. I want to say no, because... The poem was able to do it pretty well. But if it just because it worked in a poem doesn't mean it works in a two and a half hour movie. Right. We've seen films with lots of characters, though, and not every character gets their own arc or development. But really, it's supposed to help the main character. It's supposed to help the audience better understand the main character's Mm -hmm. motivations. I don't think that this was balanced that well. Benioff claimed he was aware of this challenge. And in a uh, article for creative screenwriting, he said, quote, the script covers the Trojan War in its entirety, whereas the Iliad is only one fragment of it. I did not want to have little titles saying flash forward nine years. It would have made it more faithful to the source material, but it wouldn't have been effective for the movie. I always followed the route that I thought was better for the movie. If that meant I was cheating on Homer, then so be it. End quote. I actually don't mind that this wasn't super faithful to the poem. I think it was the right decision not to include the gods as mm-hmm. characters. That would have made this a completely different movie. It had enough characters as is. Pretty important part of like the story. It would be a very like you said a very different mm-hmm. kind of movie and this one was trying to be a bit more grounded in reality, kind of some mythological tidbits added Certainly here and there. Certainly the characters yeah. were responding to and invoking gods and things like that, though, frankly, not maybe nearly as much as you might actually want or expect. I actually think that, um, and I'm interested if this is covered a bit more in the director's cut, if invoking gods or things like that comes into play a little bit more as motivation, or at least a recognition of everything's a damn sign, everything's a damn like, you know, Oh, uh, this happened. Well, clearly that means Apollo's favor is on us or Zeus's favor is upon us or something like that. Because that's very... It does. It does. It's very real. A lot of premonition, everything that's kind of seen, whether it's the armor mm-hmm. that is put on, yeah. like you said, invo- invoking ritual and um, speaking of the different Greek gods. So they definitely add a bit more of that in the director's cut. Especially for Peter O'Toole's character, mm-hmm. Priam. It, mm-hmm. The director's cut really explains why he keeps siding with his priest over his son, Hector. Remember, Hector keeps giving him like really sound military advice, yeah. and, he, and the priest is like, well, there was this eagle with a serpent, so <laughs> we should do something else. And then Peter O'Toole's like, you're right, we should. Mm-hmm. And the director's cut explains why he feels that way. Would have been nice for it to be in the theatrical cut. <laughs> yeah, it would have. No, the director was like, that'll be too weird for these audience, for the audience. That said, something I, that was in my mind that I'm interested to jump off on this, because, and I don't think you guys covered it last time you talked about. So I know that 
the Iliad is sort of like a it's a it's a poem that also gets sort of like told about the end of the war. And they reference things that happened before and things that led up to it. But it's a bit more about like the final days and the final times of this long running conflict for against of Troy and, and the Greeks. I was curious if and this may be really hard to tell, but like, is that a better framing than trying to tell it chronologically from beginning to end and instead start having basically the movie starts with everybody's like, oh, we've been at this for 10 years. We're not getting anywhere with this Trojan siege. We, you know, when's this going to break? Something like that. Is that a better flavor for this story and film that it gives space to improve upon uh, maybe not trying to cover quite as much? Do you know what I mean? It's hard to say. That's a really I, open. I actually like the structure that they mm. did here because based on what we see, or at least what they were framing as the, the setting of the mm. conflict, right? It, I mean, I, I, jo I jokingly said this earlier, but I actually think it makes sense. The whole thing basically takes place on a beach. Yeah. And the way they were framing this movie, it's like if they had done it that way, it's like they would have maybe had to change how they approached the war because it's like, wait a minute, you're telling me that they've just been laying siege to the city for mm. 10 years? It's like, how would you explain that? I think it would have been unfulfilling as a mm. movie or at least what they are trying to do. If they had started off in the late stage of this 10-year conflict, we, but we all three of us agreed this takes place over a few weeks at most. Mm -hmm. I think for the movie they were telling, especially when you're omitting the gods as characters, I like how they approached mm -hmm. it here. Okay. Anton, any opinion on that? No, I mean, I think uh, <laughs> I'm... I agree with you. I feel like we're what we have here is a film that in terms of execution, they did show that they really had the depth that was probably fit the vision with the director's cut. But again, probably just for a standard release, it wasn't going to be able to compete at the awards or at the Academy Awards if we have like a what a four hour film. Yeah. Achilles is the main character. The coolest S character. Sort of like how Qui-Gon is the main character of Phantom Menace. Uh, I mean, his face is on the front of the poster, yeah. that's for sure. He's the biggest star in the movie. I don't find him very sympathetic at all. He's also not the most important character in the Iliad. It's Agamemnon, right? Yeah. There are some scenes where they are really trying to present him as sympathetic, right? When he like when he loses Patroclus and he you know, he's crying over Hector's body mm -hmm. at one point. But He's vain. He's prideful. He reminds me of like a surfer dude, frat boy. It's like there's a lot of scenes where it's like, am I supposed to be rooting for this guy? It's very inconsistent. I think it's interesting because I do. I was very curious because, in fact, I think this is one of my reads on maybe Pitt's performance, which I don't think Pitt's performance is necessarily bad, but... I, you know, I was kind of curious about would would an Achilles that's more even more boisterous and more kind of out out there be more at least interesting f with his kind of back and forth kind of is he heroic, is he sympathetic, whatnot? Do you want an Achilles that's more kind of like yelling and doing stuff you know brad pitt just i think as an actor is going to bring a little bit more of an aloofness and i was just like achilles from what i remember and always kind of stood out was a guy who's very over the top and that's not what i think this portrayal is of the character more pensive more brad pitt aloofness and that was something that i was kind of like I don't know if that would work better or if that would even portray more of a more completeness to the arc, right? You know, have him start out being more over the top and then become more like, oh, wait, I actually want things that aren't just like kind of being the greatest or something, but still have him die in the end because he made the choices that he made and ended up where he did, you know? He goes to Troy mm -hmm. for glory, right? We know that because that brief discussion he has mm -hmm. with his mother played by Julie yeah. Christie. But then it's like halfway through it, he's just going to sit everything out because he doesn't like Agamemnon, Agamemnon. Now, obviously the conflict between those two characters is the central part mm -hmm. of the Iliad, but I don't think this film does a good job of addressing like w what really motivates him. 
He goes there for one reason. He's going to leave for a completely different mm-hmm. reason. But then he decides to stay ostensibly for glory or no, he's trying to save Briseis. Yeah, that's it's- kind of where, one, my point about uh, if you do this as a 10 years thing, you can maybe kind of reference more, suggest a little bit more. I guess they did that with the opening of the film, that there's more of a conflict between Achilles and Agamemnon. Like there's a history of conflict. They have this thing. Yeah, they're, they're really trying, pushing They're it. pushing it. But I, I think part of it is like, I think you need a showy Achilles. I think you need an Achilles who's out there, I think, being like, everyone loves me. And Agamemnon's like, man, that Achilles, he's so hot right now. Like everyone loves Achilles. You know, like, a, like a almost, I actually honestly thought about this multiple times, but I actually want like Will Ferrell and Zoolander saying like, oh, that Achilles, he's so hot right now. Like everybody, everybody loves Achilles and Agamemnon stewing like, man, everyone loves Achilles so much. And Achilles is out there getting all the glory like, hey, come on, shower me with love and affection. And it's when Agamemnon comes in and says, no, I remember I'm the king. Achilles is like, man, I hate this guy so much. Ugh, I'm, I'm out of here. Like, I want like, like over the top, like pouty boy Achilles, like not, not Brad Pitt pensive, like aloof, like, uh, maybe my desk is my desk, my glory and my destiny here. You say, oh, he's like a, a surfer boy. I want like, 21 year old Achilles being full of himself like all the time like he was in the poem I think that's maybe kind of what's missing a little bit with that and then if you want to have a love story where he becomes grounded with love or whatever I'm not saying that's the best way to deal with the Achilles character but then it's like oh the transformation for him is he decides he wants something else but he's already fulfilled this destiny of he went to go fight in this conflict and he's just kind of cursed to die there because he made that choice, even though he maybe regrets it at the last minute. Boom. Done. Fixed Achilles plot line. There you go. Don't cast Brad Pitt as Achilles. I think that makes a lot of sense. One of the issues we've already talked about with the film is mm-hmm. just balance. If we add that much more story to Achilles' character, I think that takes away a lot yeah. of the screen time that Orlando Bloom would have gotten in in the film. And I, I actually really mean that when you see the amount of screen time that Paris's character is getting, the amount of development for his story arc, and along with any, you know, all of the leads, I feel like there is definitely an improper balance in being able to develop and show kind of those motivations. And at the same time, like, I totally agree. Like, we kind of have a bit more of an aloof Achilles mm-hmm. in the film and a bit more showy, like, almost like a, a real football star in the stadium kind of moment, I think would have been a bit more on the nose for this kind of character. I think you guys said in the previous that maybe just his visual look and kind of was the precursor to the Hemsworth like Thor later on. And I the piss yes. blonde hair, yeah. And I kind of think maybe that <laughs> more over the top kind of character may have fit this a little bit right as an arc anyway was just a thought with that i tend to watch this film as like a Mm. war movie it's obviously not a faithful adaptation of the iliad right like and i I don't care about that like i I, i'm i obviously have a lot of respect for that poem but it's like i like the concept of what they were doing here or at least in my own mind i think of this as a Mm. war movie Mm mm-hmm so if I'm watching a war movie, you generally want someone to root for, right? Or at least a side to root for. Hector fits the bill of the most classic definition mm-hmm. of a hero, right? He's a family man. He's a badass, a great warrior. He's a, a, a very well-respected general, right? Everyone in Troy loves him, right? He's the crown prince. He's loyal to his father, despite his father being a complete moron about a bunch of different mm-hmm. things. He has honor, right? Both of you mentioned how honorable he is uh, earlier. He, he certainly is. He's also very pragmatic. You know, like he's not really, he's not blinded by anything. Like he, he when he was talking to his wife, he's like, look, I don't think we can win this war. Or maybe his father. Mm-hmm. He's very realistic about their chances, right? He doesn't have any flaws. Now, in one, on one hand, you could say he's a very boring character. But he's not the protagonist, right? They The film wants Achilles to be. So they're presenting Achilles as the protagonist, but this other guy who's fighting against him is presented to us as far more likable and easier to root for. I find that a challenge. 
I'm just going to run through some of the other characters and let you guys respond to this. But then, okay, so it's like, uh, I should be rooting for Hector, but the film is trying to get me to root for mm-hmm. Achilles. Orlando Bloom and Diane Kruger as Paris and Helen. They're both complete idiots, naive, foolish. Yeah. They're not very likable. You know, Orlando yeah, Bloom's the worst. It's like, I, I obviously can't root for them. Yeah, Orlando Bloom and Onion. So I just don't know who I'm supposed to root for in this film. I do think that is one of the challenges. I think you get to the end of this film and you're kind of like, I don't know who I'm who I'm going for. I and I think to your point, Patrick, it also doesn't fully land to me for a number of reasons. It doesn't fully also land the oh, the horrors of war. Oh, it's just so terrible, the cost and tragedy of of conflict or something like that. Yeah, at the end you're like, Do I want Orlando Bloom to escape? No. Right, but it doesn't... You can't root for the Greeks because they're led by the warmongering Agamemnon, mm-hmm. right? He or should you be rooting for the Greeks because Achilles fighting for the Greeks? It's it's tough. It is tough, and it does sort of end where I know different people die who aren't supposed to die and things like that. But it does. Um, sorry about that, guys. He got eaten again. Yeah, man, I hate it when that happens. Yeah, it was the Lacoste crocodile. For no, sure. no worries. Where were we? I think you were you were talking, right? I was just finishing up about what was I finishing up about? How much you love it's Orlando Bloom? And um, yeah, who are you supposed to root for? You're not really rooting for the Greeks. You're not really rooting for Helen or and Paris. Yeah, I mean, kind of just a lot of people just end up dead by the end of this movie. So not the right ones. Yeah, it's really interesting to see David Benioff attached to this film. When I think about lots of characters and trying to balance together different motivations alongside lines where characters have a bit of gray, where there's not great characteristics about them, but then also other characteristics maybe surrounding their circumstance that make you want to root for them. I see that played, of course, in Game of Thrones. You see that in a lot of different films, usually to be a bit more quote unquote nuanced. They try to be a bit more mature in the storytelling, try to be a bit more complex. I feel like maybe that was a bit of the angle here, but I don't think that it was to the advantage of the actual storytelling. Probably should have been a series, like a six-part series or something. Yeah, not sure if that's a thing that would have been in any anyone's thought. It's so, No, definitely not. Not in 2004. Mean, well, maybe not so a... Sure, maybe a way to tell the the motivations a bit more effectively would have been a series, but I think there is a way to make this a film. And you know, Nathan had a really good example of even telling Achilles' story a bit more effectively. I think it's just distilling a bit more, a lot less focus on all of the characters. I would say the most poorly written is I, I'm, I'm going to keep ragging on paris mm-hmm. and helen like what does she see in him what, what's the attraction the same thing that uh people see in all of the frail leading action stars of today i suppose i you, you get where i'm coming from right like i th- at no point does the film really explain like why she decides to run like other than she's just terrified and hates men mm-hmm. allow us it's like because she has second thoughts in the poem and considers leaving him because he's a coward mm-hmm. Well, and, the, and the film the sort of shows that, but then again, half asses it, where they end up together in the end. Oh, they're this wonderful couple. They're the survivors of the film. And you're like, why? Yeah, there's no brushing around. Paris is a super lame character, clearly not someone to root for, exactly like his character in the <laughs> Iliad. Yeah. Look, I mean, we'll get to the cast in the next reason, but I'm just going to say it now. I do think, I know, Anton, you've made the point that Orlando Bloom is playing him the way they wrote him. I think it's a miscast, though, because I just don't see how he's this this seducer of hundreds of women. Like, okay, okay, I just right, don't, right, I just right. don't buy it. Okay, seducer of hundreds of women. Orlando Orlando, Bro- Orlando Bloom at the time, still in his youth, very handsome. I think that's literally why he was cast. And like, is he like? I mean, what is it? It's not a who had classic Hollywood good looks. Humphrey Bogart. I don't know. Like, no. Yeah, no, no, not him. No. no, like, imagine if he had been played by, like, Daniel Craig or someone like that. You're like, okay, I get that. No, I don't see it. I think you need to have someone that looks frail, but at the same time, like, 
people. Yeah, right. People. I gotta tell I you, really, he he like, does he, he does not fill out the armor well at all. No, he looks like someone like if he lifted his sword, I'm pretty sure like his arm would snap. I have to wonder if that fight with Brendan Gleason, like that could have been real. Like Brendan Gleason <laughs> would destroy him. Sure. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, and I think you could kind of do something here. It'd be interesting. All you need is maybe another scene where Helen's kind of like, yeah, I picked him because I saw my way out, right? And then like kind of, you know, you could characterize her more as the the one who's actually putting this together, where I think it feels a miswriting or a miss, like it doesn't make a lot of sense is they both feel very passive and they both feel like, you know, oh, I guess we could kind of do this, right? I think that's one way of yeah. writing it that you could at least give it kind of tie it up. Oh, she's using Paris to get out of something more directly than the film doesn't really the film. You could maybe read that, but it certainly doesn't say that. You know what I mean? And then Paris is just a tool that she's using to, you know, get out of this bad marriage out of out of Sparta kind of thing. Just a tool, just a tool, but not a tool. That's different. <laughs> no, not Peter O'Toole. Odysseus is the best character in the film. Agreed. I would watch the Odyssey. Yes, the Odyssey. with him, with Sean Bean. Hell yeah! I was, yeah. I was actually one surprised that it wasn't mentioned on your guys' last talk about Troy. But also, Sean Bean for a guy who is memed so much as dying in every movie, the ultimate survivor in this one. He is memed for that, but I think actually in a majority of films he doesn't mm. die. It's even worse. It was in Ronin. He just gets kicked out because they fi they figure out he's a poser. Yeah. What color is the boathouse of Hereford? He's like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> what an awesome movie, Ronin. <laughs> They're like, get out, you poser. So good. Underrated, would you say? Absolutely. Such a fun yeah. film. The MacGuffin the whole time. Yeah, it's just, it's, uh, yeah. What a good movie. Well, in the same interview I referenced in the production history, James Horner himself had some thoughts on the plot. In an in interview for, it's a magazine called Dreams to Dream, which I can't imagine that's still around. It's a weird magazine title. It is. It is niche. Uh, he was talking primarily about composing the score, but he observed, quote, I was surprised by the movie's final shot, focusing on the dead Achilles as the denouement. You don't really know where Helen is off to. You don't really know how Paris will end up. You don't really know what will happen to Troy. In the end, everything hinges on Achilles his death, his legend, and his romantic involvement with Briseis. In keeping with this focus, I suggested to Wolfgang that I thought it would be a good decision to forget about both Helen and Paris in the score and instead focus all my attention on Achilles. This is where I found Troy surprising because in Wolfgang's design, the characters take a backseat to Achilles. End quote. I kind of get his mm. point. He's basically saying the romance that triggers the plot isn't even the main focus. Mm -mm. What is it, the face that... <laughs> launched a thousand launched, ships yeah. yeah garrett headland the face that launches a thousand ships the other way i think there's some truth to that including for their country Iliad, though like kind of by the time you get to the end of it it's like who's really thinking about helen of troy anymore like we're on to just that this conflict is there so whether it hind works to hinge it all on achilles i don't know but certainly i get i get the i get his point how do we feel about the romance between Achilles and Briseis. Unnecessary? Yeah, I'd say it's either it didn't really land in a way that I think is working. Either it needs to be more in the film or less in the film. You know what I mean? The amount that it's in the film at this mm -hmm. point, at least in the theatrical cut, I don't think adding doing doing what it needs to do. Another thought, not related to that, but this is something I've always felt was one of the biggest weaknesses of the theatrical version of this film is the actual sack of Troy is very brief and just feels tacked on at the end. Mm -hmm. And it's a very lengthy sequence in the director's cut, as it should have been in, in, the, in the theatrical version. It's a real flaw, I think. Yeah, it's very lengthy. I mean, very graphic in the, in the director's cut. And not to say that it has to be graphic, but I think that it just kind of helps to emphasize the big budget and the vastness of this film. I think you have to also look at from within that context of this is supposed to feel grandiose. And I feel like if you're going to do like a sack of Troy, do it big. You do get the sense the film really peaks when Achilles kills Hector. Because mm -hmm. you just know, like, all right, like, when is this going to be over? The one of the two main characters is now dead. Yeah. 
definitely takes the stakes out a bit. And the one person that I think a lot of people were more so rooting for is dead. So <laughs> I was like, who am I rooting for now? I guess yeah. Achilles. It's like, oh, well, don't bet on that pony. Nathan, are we interesting you in the director's cut at this point? It does sound intriguing just because I'm wondering how much that extra characterization for um, a number of things is helpful. As, uh, honestly, though, the one that's landing maybe the most intriguing is the help of probably getting more characterization for Priam and Peter O'Toole's character, who is very hard to figure out why he's doing what he's doing for most of this. Feels very off for, like, feels like he's just taking loss after loss, bad decision after bad decision the entire course of this film. For no, for no real reason other than to just be making the bad, the wrong decision. One of the things I think Benioff got right, though, there's a lot of really good dialogue in this film. There's a lot of bad dialogue, too. Like the gods envy us. Some of my favorite lines I wrote down early in the film when Agamemnon's talking to his uh, aide named Nestor. He says, we don't need, to, Nestor tells him, we don't need to control Achilles. We need to unleash him. That, more, that man was born to end lives. Nestor. Any uh, favorite quotes from either one of you? No, I don't really have a ton of great quotes in this it's, film. For me, it may be only because I, I don't, I'm still trying to judge whether I think it's like a good quote. But I did like when they when um, Brad Pitt lands uh, the ship for the first time. He's like, "Immortality is yours." Like, yeah. uh, what's it like? Sees it or something like that. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. From yeah. the from it's a very trailer yeah, I'm friendly sure line. That was like yeah. in all the trailers, so I like that one. I don't know how quotable it is, but all of the dialogue between him and Priam in that scene where Priam comes into Achilles' tent is is it's really good. Yeah, it's just a really well written, well acted scene. It's the best scene in the film for my money. I think it's definitely a standout uh, dialogue scene for sure. For sure. Number two reason: Brad Pitt and the rest of the cast. This is one of the most polarizing lead performances in a major blockbuster. There are a lot of people that really like Brad Pitt as Achilles, and there are a lot of people that do not. I'm torn mm. on it. I think he's one of the best actors in mm. the film, but I don't think that everything around him is a good story told. and I don't think it's necessarily his fault. I'm trying to think how to articulate this. Achilles is a very arrogant, prideful mm -hmm. character in the source material, and he certainly... Mm -hmm conveys that on screen mm -hmm. yeah I, I, achilles from my memory in the poem is a pretty one-dimensional character he's fighting for glory right mm -hmm. and he's he is his uh hatred for agamemnon goes hand in hand with his mm -hmm. ego right his ego is seeking glory he think he thinks agamemnon is in the way of that he's presented as a little bit more complex here we talked about like what his motivations are in this film kind of gets them confused. On the other hand, what I don't like about Brad Pitt's performance is I don't know what kind of accent he's doing here. Um it it changes a couple times throughout the film sure. too. He's making some some kind of attempt at a quasi Mediterranean accent. I don't know exact I don't know. We looked at his roots. He's from Oklahoma, right? Little Oki. I felt like that was coming through. I like to think maybe he was getting a bit of a sunstroke, so he was Going back to his roots. He's never done this accent in a movie before or since, as far as I can tell. I think in general, I have a really... I didn't look into it, so if you have any details, I'm really curious what the what the accent direction, not f just for him, but overall the direction, because you get such a broad range of accents in this film. Like, you have people who are just sticking to what they know, changing things up you have like there was one like guard that achilles like at the very end during the siege that he has like his sword pulled on who's like just such a strong english accent to the point that i'm like really almost like, thrown out of it <laughs> he's like please i have a family yeah, exactly. it's just like I, i'm it I don't know if this is everyone just kind of do whatever you feel like kind of a moment and everyone just kind of did. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and thus, because it was no direction, everyone kind of did something and Pitt just kind of landed somewhere of like, I guess I could try this kind of thing. I don't hate the accent, I'll say. I don't think it's off-putting to the point that I'm like... 
oh my god, why why stop talking, please? I think just the more kind of furrowed brow, like pensive, like broodingness is where I'm getting a little bit of not as into his expression of the character. Cause I again, as I've already said before previously, you know, 15 minutes ago, I think that character needs to be different is my read on what I think kind of the movie needs and kind of what would be best of a fit there. But given kind of what he's aiming for, I think it's not, you know, the worst, the worst thing. <laughs> yeah, we talked about this the first time we recorded in that this is not a typical role that mm-hmm. Brad Pitt would take. No. He loves to take much more interesting roles, yeah. right? And I feel like if this is him going up to the studio and saying, hey, I'm going to do this film, but doing so, I'm going to have a little bit of fun with the role. I'm going to try a few things out. I've been really- it might seem like I'm phoning in, but I promise I care. We some accent training well, like with a coach recently, and we just want to we want to try something out and see how it lands. So do you mind if I do this in our multi-million dollar high budget film? Cool. Yeah, like, yeah, go for it. Well, we have to talk about why he actually did mm-hmm. the film, because this is probably the most important piece to this, Anton. You mm-hmm. just brought up how this is not a typical Brad Pitt performance. He was forced into doing this. That's why he did this role. He wasn't happy with it. He did it because of a contractual obligation. And he, he spoke publicly about this. We, we, we read this quote on the original recording. I will read it again now because it deserves to be discussed. He said, quote, I had to do Troy because I guess I can say this now. I pulled out of another movie and then I had to do something for the studio. So I was put in Troy. It wasn't painful, but I realized that the way the movie was being told was not how I wanted it to be. I made my own mistakes in it. What am I trying to say about Troy? I could not get out of the middle of the frame. It was driving me crazy. I'd become spoiled by working with David Fincher. It's no slight on Wolfgang Peterson. Das Boot is one of the all-time great films. But somewhere in it, Troy became a commercial kind of thing. Every shot was like, here's the hero. There was no mystery. So about that time, I made a decision that I was only going to invest in quality stories for lack of a better term. It was a distinct shift that led to the next decade of films, end quote. Hmm. Yeah, and we all know the film that he said no to. It's The Fountain, directed by Darren Aronofsky. I like Aronofsky a lot. I do too. It was going to come out before Troy. Warner Brothers ended up canceling it. You can read a whole bunch about it. Pitt had a bunch of issues with the screenplay. They released it a couple years after this with Hugh Jackman in that role. Yeah, then Hugh Jackman had a weird experience because he was old and then young and then old again. Yeah, it's a weird movie. Yeah, it's a really weird movie. I'm only speculating about what Brad Pitt did not like about the story. I, I wonder if it's some of the stuff we talked about, though, like the conflicting motivations. And just like so we're clear on this, I don't think this is a bad performance from Brad Pitt. I think physically, he doesn't phone it in at all. He is incredible physically as Achilles. He absolutely sells all of the fighting techniques and choreography Mm -hmm. in this film. He's incredible in that part of the film. He obviously got in shape for it. I mean, he Mm -hmm. quit smoking and I mean, I'm assuming he had something like like 5% body fat for this film. He looks like like Stallone in like Rocky III. Oh, just shredded. Yeah, it's like that. That part of the performance, I think Pitt excels at. Yeah, I mean, he looked like he was carved out of marble, all that good stuff. Yeah, so I have to give him a lot of credit for that. I mean, uh, Nathan, what are your thoughts on this, though? On his physicality? Certainly, I also want to say I don't think Brad Pitt's a bad actor. I don't think he's a right fit for kind of the film, maybe, but you may not. I don't know who I'd have to spend time thinking about who maybe you would want to place him with potentially. But I do think to his credit, yes, he did a good job. I mean, he invested for the physicality of it. Absolutely. Honestly, should have been utilized more, right? Should have used that fit physicality more. I think that's where like having him be over the top and be almost like using his physicality constantly would have been even a better way of showing all that off. Um, And certainly I think you get to see that because they they also definitely recognize that and made that a part of his characterization in the film. Anytime he is physical, anytime he's moving, anytime he's fighting, he's a different than every other person. And that's, you know, definitely for the coordination and the editing and the, you know, direction, but also to Pitt and his physicality that, you know, his what he did to get in shape and to portray, you know, he is a he is a predator 
in every single fight scene and everyone else is his prey. And that is uh, really uh, one thing that I thought was really outstanding for that portrayal of Achilles across the board. Ironically, he injured his Achilles tendon during filming. That's <laughs> funny. Quite ironic. The Lord has a sense of humor. He certainly does. If you're feeling bad about Brad Pitt being forced to do this movie, don't because I looked up his salary and Warner Brothers paid him $17.5 million like, to be in this movie. So he made out okay. Isn't that like a tenth of the budget? And just about. That's pretty normal, though, for most blockbusters. You're usually paying the star somewhere between you know 10 and 20% of the budget, give or take. Sometimes more. Oof. Well, that's a hefty sum, so, you know, good for him. Yeah. I'm just going to venture a guess that the cast some, somewhere cost in like the 40 to $50 million range, if you're adding up everyone. It's really interesting to think about the context of that, though, because like what, what does that kind of comprise? Like 40% of the budget overall? Almost a like third? A thir like a third? Yeah. Uh, there was a report that I read recently. Ryan Gosling requested $50 million if he's going to play ken again in the next barbie film Good there's a him. lot yeah there's a lot of speculation it's just to ensure <laughs> that a second one is never made which you liked it though right yeah and i and i really liked it and so like i kind of see this there's a bit of people saying he respects the first movie too much that he doesn't want hollywood to try to force a second film to be made but interesting the other side of it is people will say well ken will just get recast well look if they can blow 200 million dollars on the second Joker movie, they can spend fifty million dollars to pay Ryan Gosling to to be Ken again. I'm sure they can drudge up the money somehow. Uh, the first one made what, like a billion and a half? It was a ton yeah, of money. Yeah, made over a billion dollars. They just they killed it. Earlier, we were discussing well, who else co possibly could have played Achilles? Now, take this with a huge grain of salt because there were no sources provided, according to chat. According to ChatGPT, Russell Crowe, Hugh Jackman, and Mel Gibson were considered. I don't believe that, though. Like, I could not find a single source on it. So those names make sense, but they also don't. So we were talking about Heath Ledger as a potential. Yeah. yeah. Just because I was doing a rundown on the list of... Our potential, yeah, not, not well, like our a rumor, potential, but like yes. ours. I was looking at a list of like, okay, <laughs> yeah. what other actors were kind of in that space? Because I like Brad Pitt for the physicality of the role. Right. You know, I think he looks the part. He certainly put in the work to be physically there for the part. But, um, you know, I was just thinking what other actors kind of could maybe bring maybe a, a bit of a different energy, as I was saying earlier, like, oh, I, I kind of would see like to see Achilles a little bit more kind of boisterous, a little bit more uh, flamboyant rather than kind of pensive and moody. And I thought, you know, of mm. the short list, at least, I don't know. Ledger, that's but that's such a uh, you know unknown. Yeah, that's a real what if. That's a what if. As far as the rest of the casting goes, I thought it was pretty spot on for the most part. Now you could say the performances themselves from the rest of the cast perhaps uneven. We can get into this. Mm -hmm. We we were talking about Sean Bean as Odysseus earlier. Oh gosh, he's great. Yeah, he's uh, super cool. I think one one of them that fits fits really well and you like you definitely go oh, i wish i could have seen a bit more of him perfect for a sequel they'd have to find it, some it, material it, it, though it, i'm not sure it really makes me mad at hollywood because like we would all want to see a sequel with sean bean in it and it's like we didn't get that but we got those awful clash of the titans movies a with few sam years Worthington. later yeah oh, just just awful but they made good money right so I'm sure they did, but like, does, who does that? Is anyone talking about them 15 years later? No, we are. You know what I mean, Anton? When was the last time you heard anyone ever talk about like, you know, it was amazing the Clash of the Titans remake? I haven't, but I'm sure if we go to towns where there's more lead in the water, they will be talking about it a lot. On the last rewatch, I was thinking about this. So they make a lot of references to Odysseus's so-called tricks, and of course, we get it late in the film with the Trojan horse. He seems to be the only Greek who gives any thought to battle tactics. Like Agamemnon's basic strategy is to just charge his army at the walls of Troy and do what? Try to win. I feel like <laughs> yeah, so try to win. it's been a while since I've, a few years since I last read the Iliad. But I I feel like that's actually maybe not too unkind to the 
way it's just kind of described in the book where people just kind of go and fight <laughs> and Odysseus is acknowledged as being the one Fair. who's actually kind of thinking about these things, but everyone else is kind of like, oh, we're just going to go out to the battlefield and kind of just, you know. I really liked how Odysseus mm -hmm. is the narrator. It makes perfect sense. Oh, yeah. I think a great framing for it. And um feel like maybe they should have even done, because there's an opening, like an opening scrawl kind of scroll, scrawl? It's a scrawl. Word from mm -hmm. scroll. <laughs> scroll. Scroll, scroll. <laughs> there's an opening <laughs> Opening, so opening you know, words on the screen, maybe that should have just also been Odysseus talking about stuff. I wouldn't have minded just even a little bit more Sean Bean. Well, you need to see the director's cut. That would have been a really cool sequel, though. I know we, I just keep thinking about it. Yeah, like Sean it, Bean. Sean Bean's adventure. Right there. I, you have to think if the movie had made more money, they would have entertained it. Because, you know, this movie, it made money, but just not yeah. enough. I think that would have been a cooler cast in the sense that the Odyssey is almost just like an adventure with the boys. And I feel like if you had a big budget around that, you could have gotten some really cool I names around like, it. We've never we've never gotten a, a really ultimate adaptation of the Odyssey, have we? Uh, nothing comes to mind of like a big budget studio vehicle. No. I think you get something a la Jason and the Argonauts as a close comparison. Yeah, that's, yeah. But I mean, like, we watched some kind of adaptation of the Odyssey in high school, and whatever it was, it wasn't very good. I think it was a TV movie, if I'm not mistaken, but whatever. All right, Brian Cox. He said this was the only role he ever, quote, actively pursued, end quote. He wanted to star in this kind of movie. He's handing it up to perfection. Agamemnon is a complete stock character. He's a total asshole, and it's wonderful to watch. Yeah, I love makes, Brian Cox. Yeah, makes sense. Brian Cox always kills it in these kinds of Shakespearean roles. Was this the same year he was Striker in X2, or was that the year before this? Uh, wasn't it the same year? I think X2 come out around the same time. Pretty similar role, and I mean that in a good way, because he, I, I, he's great as striker, and you know he's he's channeling the same energy here, and it's it's just he's having a lot of fun with it. I see why he pursued the role. Same thing with Brendan Gleeson, who plays his brother. He plays a great ham. This is the type of role I think where I don't mind mm -hmm. actors hamming it up. Yeah, I mean, they, in was, some ways, they if, felt the most at least kind of you know, uh, not punishing to watch on screen, certainly. <laughs> this actually might be a little bit of a hot take on my part. I actually found these two brothers, like their relationship, more interesting than Achilles. I wish they had gotten a little bit more screen time. I think that just speaks to their acting prowess. And then yeah. also there's a bit more of a focus of that in the Iliad as well. So leaning into that a bit more totally makes sense that in maybe even a more traditional sense, their scenes together are very well acted. Now, the heavyweight in here, Peter O'Toole. Diane Kruger complained that he was often drunk and mean <laughs> on set to her <laughs> and to other cast members. The twilight of his years, legendary Peter O'Toole. He, uh, he didn't think much of this film. He walked out of a screening of this film after only 15 minutes, and then later in an interview, he called Wolfgang Peterson a clown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, if there was ever any anyone that had the past to do something like that, I think Peter O'Toole has been around the block when it comes to Hollywood. Oh, yeah. So if he's seen some tomfoolery in his day, he spots it and he knows it. And I think he still gave a great performance. <laughs> you know, earlier, Nathan, you brought up there was a lot of questions about his character's motivation and decision decision making. But I think his performance very good. I still have a maybe a bit of a tougher time separating from some of that, but I am intrigued by what you mentioned for the director's cut, maybe giving some context for that. I feel like a number of scenes like him encouraging Paris, like, oh, yeah, you know, it's so great that you're doing this for love felt just very like, ah oh, man, you're just making so many bad decisions left and right. I do agree that oh, I think, you know, the scene when he meets with Achilles on the beach in Achilles' tent is, of course, a great scene and definitely one where he is um, getting to show his skills as an actor. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like that that scene alone, you're just, mm -hmm. you come away from it. You're like, man, O'Toole didn't phone this in. He still got it. And what do the great, the acting greats share often? The skill of subtlety. 
Yeah, is, is that, that what, what you, you think this is? So? It sounds like sarcasm. Oh, I'm I'm being I'm being sarcastic. I'm okay, being sarcastic. I, I thought so. I was gonna say there's there's not no. a whole lot of subtlety here, but no. yeah. No, and that's again feels a little bit like so many other characters are just saying and acting very straightforward to where Achilles kind of moodiness and introspection feels slightly at odds with the way everybody else in this movie is behaving that, you know, just is like, oh, I'm not sure whether that's fitting or intriguing. And I think Peter O'Toole is another example of very straightforward. I think, you know, competent acting, but as a character, very straightforward in terms of what that character is doing. <laughs> I have written down his eyes are so blue. I thought they were CGI in some scenes. And then I remembered like, oh, yeah, Lawrence of Arabia. His, yeah. his eyes really are that blue. He has a piercing blue eyes. He does. All right. Eric Bana as Hector. What do we think? Uh, he's uh, you. You like him. I think you, you end up liking him. He's uh, he's like, you know, as we said, he's the heroic guy. A little boring, but also competent. And you're like, ah, oh, this guy seems good. Yeah, I like Eric Bana. And I think that while he's one of the few characters that you want to root for, I'm going to go ahead and just say that I still feel like there could have been someone else in the role that maybe would have been a bit more exciting. Hugh Jackman? Maybe. I'll say this. He is certainly a more convincing warrior general than he is a scientist. Yeah, that dude was super, how do I say, covert the rest of his career, right? He has some few pretty big roles over the years. He has. He's in Munich. He's great in Munich. I really I like him in Munich. I think like that probably is his most memorable role that comes to mind. He was also in, he had a really small but very funny role in Funny People mm -hmm. with Adam Sandler. Um, he was in the first Star Trek reboot as uh, yes, he plays the, uh, Nero. The Romulan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and then he played the iconic role as the voice of Monterey Jack in Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Oh, right. You're, I should have yeah. remembered that. You're right. From what I understand... His real passion is racing, and a lot of the film roles that he takes now works around that. So if he's doing what he wants to do, just living in Australia and doing racing, more power to him. Yeah, he loves racing and Australian rules football. Yeah. You know what? Good for him. Yeah, good for him. He seems like he's living, living his, his life. We're just working our way down the cast here. Diane Kruger, she's had a good career. This was basically her first role. I think she's fine. Do you think that she's as attractive as would launch a thousand ships? I do. I don't know. I would have preferred Lucy Liu. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> it's all subjective, Anton. I'm not going to touch that one. No, yeah, I do no, think I, she, I was like fine. she was fine. She, was she doesn't fine. have a lot to yeah. do here except just look, you know, yeah, like a hostage half the time. They don't have enough time to give her a lot much, uh, you know, much, or at least they have the choice to not give her much. And she can act because we've seen this later on. Like, I really like her in the National Treasure movies. She's great in Inglorious Bastards. Like, she really can act. Yeah, she can. And in this particular film, I think that the assignment was act kidnapped and act pretty. Right. And look, I'm just going to say this again. If you like her, you'll like the director's cut more. This is where it's going to get serious because we have to talk about Orlando Bloom as Paris. We were talking about this earlier. I know that he's written to be unlikable. I know that. You could make the case that he achieves that. I still don't think he's a good actor. I'm just not a fan. But he, it makes sense that he was cast because he was such a big star at the time. He was. And I say this, I really enjoy him in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. I like that role for him. I liked him in Kingdom of Heaven. Yeah. I think he's the, he's still the weak link of Kingdom of Heaven, but I think he gets away with it, mm -hmm. so to speak. Like, Anton, you know I love Kingdom of Heaven, the director's cut as well, but was he the best actor for that role? No, he was not. And it, it's not a perfect movie. I think that definitely is like a very honest thing to look at and say he was a weak link in, in an imperfect movie, but with a really good director's cut. But I think within the context of this film... I can see the studio's reasoning of put him in there because he's a pretty face. He already has the box office appeal. It's a big movie. It's just, it's a no brainer. I suppose. Mm. Nathan, where are you on Bloom? Um, 
I mean, what have I seen really from him? I've seen some of the Pirates movie. I mean, I guess I've seen every Pirates movie. He's a main cast. Wait, isn't there a later Pirates movie he's like a main cast member in? Like Pirates like 17 or something like that? <laughs> uh, which, uh, which one was that? Vegas Vacation? <laughs> um, no, I don't think he's been a main since the first three. I mean, like, it's, it's hard because he... Uh, is also almost like nostalgic for me in terms of like Lord of the Rings and Pirates of being like a young, you know, teen, tween when these movies come out. So I like them in this movie. No, not particularly great. <laughs> Definitely a um, not a very interesting character. I think like there's something there that that, again, not enough time for a lot of these characters. Could you have made the Paris that's presented here in this film interesting maybe like kind of this like sniveling guy like you know he runs away from a fight and then but in the last 15 minutes pulls himself together with a bow and arrow and kills achilles like um sure <laughs> i don't think he's a turnoff for me because he's also not like around enough like if he was like had as much screen time as like achilles or something in this movie it would be rude. but i think he's used sparingly Goodbye, um, Orlando Bloomin' Onion. Thank you. Enjoy your life with Katy Perry. Nissan. <laughs> Today's match is brought to you by Nissan. It's a Champions oh, yeah. League reference for all you soccer fans out there. And then, uh, Nathan, you should go watch okay. Gran Turismo. It's a strange Orlando Bloom <laughs> hey, performance. I see. I see. He's in. Sorry, because I, I have him up on the side. Good movie. Um, For filmography. I guess it's interesting. He's not been in quite that much stuff. Seems to be been right no he can't act if there's ever a director's <laughs> cut of gran turismo i'm sure there's a portion of there's a lot of his character in particular <laughs> that was probably cut so rest of the cast really really solid a lot of well-known faces we mentioned julie christie as achilles mother rose byrne as briseis a very that... young rose byrne very early role for her well, yeah first, first role, role one of them and she looks exactly the same <laughs> A lot of first roles for people in the, which I think is interesting. That's way better. For considering as I think I said at the top, either before we started or at the top on this is like uh, amazing that almost everyone who's in this movie is someone either was or went on someone. Yeah, even when we get into like the even smaller roles, like I mean, Saffron Burroughs as Hector's wife, she was, uh, you know, she was in a lot of stuff in back in that era. I had to look this guy up, but, you know, Vincent Reagan plays Eudorus. He's Achilles second in command. He's He was in 300. He's popped up in a lot of, like, you know, uh, roles very similar to this one, but he's certainly a face that I recognize. Right. John Shrapnel as Nestor. James Cosmo as the, the Trojan general whose name I can't remember, but he was in a bunch of movies like this one, you know, where he's playing some kind of uh, British-ish militaristic type of character. Was he a yeah. Game of Thrones guy? In yeah, that? he was a uh, Commander Mormont of the okay. Night's Watch, father of Jorah Mormont. Yes, yes, I'll take your word for it. He was the original owner of the family sword Longclaw. That's a cool name. All right, Garrett Headland. It's his first film role. Anton, he gained 30 pounds of muscle for this role, so I think you should put some respect on his name. Uh, Well, all I can say is uh, even if he did, I don't think that uh, it made any benefit to his coordination in the film i think his choreography was off he looked so clumsy trip over a flat surface well yeah. he, he fooled hector <laughs> and the rest of them yeah, he fooled and... everyone he probably fooled you anton that's pro i think that's maybe why you have some bitterness just be honest did he get you did he get you i'll be i'll be honest he was really he was really sweaty in this movie Probably because he he's very out of shape. I mean, he he ran. He was running around. All right, he looked pretty athletic. Look, Anton, I'm with you. I don't think he's a good actor at all. However, he doesn't do enough in this movie where I like care. It doesn't bother me. Yeah, his hair looked like a bird's nest after a storm. Well, that could be a compliment depending on who you are. As someone that doesn't have hair, I I resent that. Well, Garrett Headland thinks the fax machine is the latest technology of today. <laughs> He doesn't ruin the movie for you, though, does he? He can't. He's not in it enough to have. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's. What does he yeah. have? Ten lines, maybe. Like, <sighs> okay. In in all in all <laughs> seriousness, in all seriousness, um, I feel like you're right. His his role was so small 
you feel like it wouldn't be able to just put a bad taste in your mouth. But if that bad taste was a song, it felt like a full symphony with how bad Garrett Hedlund was. Very creepy. All right, I'm going to move on here. All right. We talked about Julian Glover in the original recording, another Game of Thrones veteran. He plays a pretty small role in this film. He plays uh, Triopas, the King of Thessaly. But he really is worth shouting out because he has been in The Empire Strikes Back. He played the villain in Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade. He was a villain in a Bond movie. He was Christados in For Your Eyes Only, which is a film that we're covering later this season, Anton. Mm -hmm. And he also has the distinction, he is in the Harry Potter series. He was the voice of the giant spider Aragog in Chamber of Secrets. Very distinctive voice. Yeah. Just one more thing, Julian Glover, that's another Game of Thrones connection. Yeah, I said that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Grand Maester Pycelle. You were sort of touching on this earlier, Nathan, how the accents are all over the place in this film. It seems like half the cast is using their native accents. Half the cast is using different yeah. accents. There's not a lot of consistency. It's just, it, it's something that stands out to me whenever I rewatch this film. Yeah, I'm still curious what, if any sort of direction was given or if any, what, if any consideration was given. <laughs> Yeah, Doesn't like, seem like if it. it was, oh, this is fine, we're good, and it's to have people wildly all over the place. Or if it was, ah, we just, you know, we tried, but no one would was willing to do the work, so we just gave up. I don't know. A couple of the cast are hamming it up, but for the most part, everyone's playing it straight, and this is something that has, I think, made the film age quite well. That there's really no campiness in both the performances and the tone. It's just portrayed completely serious. And I think it's one of the best choices that they made. Uh, let's compare the portrayals to another Sword and Sandals epic. I'm actually thinking of Spartacus. They ham it up quite a bit in that film. They do. Different but it's still era, a, but it's Yeah, but it's still a great film. It is a great film. But, but you would say the, the tone of Spartacus is not campy at all. No, no, I think that there's definitely quite a difference there, yeah. Hmm. Next reason, the production. Now, this has nothing to do with the quality of the film itself, but I love the posters. I remember wanting to see the movie just based on the teaser poster alone. Mm -hmm. Great posters. You can't really call this film historical. You know, there's, there's the historical veracity of the Trojan War sure. is very much disputed. You know, we, we know that there certainly was a city of Troy. Uh, it, it's, um, it's, it's certainly not unbelievable to think that a war between the Trojans and the Greeks was fought during that era, but the details of it are just mm -hmm. completely unknown to us. When it comes down to the language, do we, I'm not sure, I'm, I was curious if either of you knew, what would they have, spo would, would they have spoken any other languages other than ancient Greek? I don't think the Trojans would have sp spoke ancient yeah. Greek. I'm not sure. That's a good question. I mean, the, the Greeks, yes, they would have spoken ancient Greek, but the Trojans, no idea, because that's a culture that I mm -hmm. you know, didn't survive. And I, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think until the 1800s, I believe it was just considered a myth. I think that's when the city was discovered. Oh, that's I think for cool. a very long time, everyone just assumed Homer's poem was a, was based on myth. But I I think it's it's been revealed fairly recently that like no, this mm. actually was a real city. Yeah, I think I've heard something similar. I know that it's like yeah. puts it somewhere in like Turkey physically, which is makes sense. Yes, across yep. the Aegean. Um, but I don't know. Um, you know where this was going to land in terms of people groups or language or something like that. Um, hmm. Look, if, if any of the listeners are Trojan, write in and tell us. Yeah, please let us know. Yeah, let us know. I mentioned this earlier. I just watched this as a war movie, which, you know, I don't know if that's the best approach, but I've always thought of this as a war movie. When you watch something as a war movie, does your thinking cap change? A little bit, because, you know, you all you have expectations for a war movie. You know there's going to be, like, X number of battles or skirmishes. There's going to be a some kind of a historical background, or in the case of it being fictional, like, potentially this, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you always have, like, you want the background to be established. You want the context to be established. You want the players to be established. Who is fighting who for what reasons? How are they fighting? How long does it take? 
and I, I something I was harping on earlier. It's like, should I be rooting for a particular side? That's very common in war movies, right? It's in some ways it makes this film very unique because all three of us agreed, kind of a challenge to figure out who you should be rooting for, if anyone. Yeah, but no, that's fair. I think that's those. Those are all elements of just a good movie. Yes, you could say that too. I may have something to say on that, but I think we should continue on because it might fit later with something about thinking about it as a war movie and expectations Ooh. we may bring to it. Oh, I like that. I like that. But we're going to come back. Like, to I'm going to come back to this. To Moving into the, you know, continuing the, the production thing. Uh, this was shot by Roger Pratt, a very, very experienced cinematographer. I like how this movie is shot. It has a very bright color palette. I feel like mm-hmm. it'd be a good summer movie. Um, so it makes total sense why we're releasing yeah. this episode oh, in November. Classic, classic late fall experience here. <laughs> Yeah. Mediterranean setting. Yeah, there's a lot of gold colors and very yeah. like bright blues. I think this movie has I mean, it's just a very good use of color in this film. It's a very bright movie. A lot of the scenes take place in the middle of the day with the sun, mm-hmm. the, the sun shining. And we know that because they had to dedicate a lot of CGI to mm-hmm. fixing that. There are a number of shots where it's, it's very obvious the actors were filmed separately. Pretty much any time during a battle scene where it cuts to, you know, pre-am, and his entourage, like up on the wall watching the battle, it's like that was not filmed in the same location at all. It's pretty obvious, but whatever. That's how it works in a lot of these movies. I get it. I think now, how much of it do you kind of feel like it's just we've seen a lot of movies, so we know how they kind of edit and block these things? It's that. Yeah. It's that. So I think that your average moviegoer probably wouldn't notice. No, but we host a movie podcast, so <laughs> we do. Yeah. <laughs> But I don't want to nitpick on that too much because I, I think this is a really well-filmed movie. Yeah, it's it looks gorgeous. Um, the attention to detail is fantastic. The sets, you can tell they spent the money. I mean, they spent a million dollars to build that mm-hmm. wall. It looks awesome. The costumes look great. In fact, this mm-hmm. was the film's only Academy Award nomination, Bob Ringwood. He was the costume designer. I didn't realize this until I was doing the research for this uh, redo, Anton. Bob Ringwood and Roger Pratt were the costume designer and cinematographer, respectively, of the 1989 Hmm. Batman. Oh, very cool. Yeah. It is a beautiful film, Anton. And we talked about this on the original episode. Is it too beautiful? Everyone is flawless looking. If this is the story of the Iliad, which is a romanticized tale, cautionary tale, you know what? Let's let's just have that. I criticized it in the original episode, and then we got a very thoughtful YouTube mm. comment on that from someone, and they made a really good point how, like, this is, I'm paraphrasing a bit, but this is not supposed to be a historical film. It's based on mythology. Mm-hmm. So you're getting a very idealized version of what this might look like, and it, I actually, this comment changed my mind on it. I think it suits mm-hmm. the film. Yeah, you know, where no, like that's... Gladiator had a lot of dirt to it, but Gladiator was more of a historical. Film. It was intended to be dirty in terms of like what it was depicting. Uh, this was after listening, and I was anticipating. This is interesting. I didn't know this context from you reading like a YouTube comment because this was one of the things that me coming into this movie and this particular discussion I was expecting to have as a point of difference was I did like that it was kind of clean and pretty. I thought that was kind of an intriguing thing because I went in expecting dirty, right? I was expecting, oh, this is supposed to be the grounded kind of thing, the harsher look and stuff like that. And I found it weirdly fun. I don't, not fun, like, oh, super exciting, but like fun that, you know, they were all like, especially early on when they're on the, uh, I remember uh, Eric Bana and Orlando Bloom on the boat towards the very beginning. And they're wearing these like bright blue outfit. Everyone, they are Brad Pitt in a different scene has these like beautiful, colorful, bright blue, like vests that they're wearing. And it's just, it's um, definitely feels more like that cleaner kind of uh older swords and sandals look rather than exactly as you said the gladiator and that's maybe where sometimes we come and bring to this movie some expectations of yeah trying to compare to gladiator or something that this is not quite trying to fit it the same way and i think that's to its credit because i don't know if doing trying to make this with the cast and the who they had involved trying to make it a grittier movie i don't know if it would have held think it might have been worse for it no they they i completely agree with you they got Mm -hmm. the look of this right and i was going to mention this a bit later but i'll i'll 
do it now because this kind of ties into what you were saying. Because I want to talk about the fight scenes. And I think the best decision Wolfgang Peterson and the rest of the production crew made is, I've seen this movie probably about 10 times, and I just didn't really put it together until now. But all of the armor slash helmet slash gear from each side of the conflict was very distinctive looking. And in the battle scenes, it's very easy to tell who is who. You have the Greeks, you have the Myrmidon, right? Achilles crew. They have a very different look than the rest of the Greeks, yeah. even though they're fighting with the Greeks. And then you have the Trojans, very distinctive looks. And it's, it's, it's something very simple, but it was a very good decision on their part because it pays mm. off in all the battle scenes. Yeah, I think that that's, yeah, that's a subtle, not a thing I was thinking about while watching it, but uh, very true. They do have very distinct looks and they are consistent across the board. Yeah. The fight scenes really do hold up. They're really well filmed. They're really well executed. I found them quite stylized, but not in a comic booky way. And it makes sense, right? Wolfgang Peterson, he knows how to direct action. I think what's uh, really clear here is also just how to keep scenes interesting when also filming a lot of people in the shot i think that that was really well done in the uh, in the film as well whether it's a sack of troy whether it's any of the larger battle scenes scenes where you just have achilles surrounded by hundreds of soldiers but still really kind of keeping a really strong balance within the shot i think that that helps a ton with any of these battle scenes and the choreography and i think that that kind of adds also to the beauty but also just how nice it looked he doesn't do shaky cam, right? Mm -hmm. Everything's filmed pretty smooth. And this is something you were touching on earlier, Nathan, that I wanted to circle back on it because I thought it was a great point on your part. This is a credit to Wolfgang Peterson, the fight coordinators, and Brad Pitt. They did a remarkable job of selling Achilles' superhuman abilities without making it cartoonish. In every single scene, he is the standout, right? He is clearly physically stronger and faster than everyone else around him, but it I, doesn't look goofy. Even as you remind me of that, I just want to, I don't remember the film doing like the slowdown effect to emphasize like any of that combat or physicality either. They only do it a very mm. few handful of times. Like when he kills Bo Agrius in the opening scene, that is slow. When he does his signature, you know, hop step mm. move where he stabs down, mm -hmm. they do that in slow motion, but it's, it's just, it, mm. it's very subtle. Yeah, because I think that's part of what also added to it. Then their very subtle use of it, it really adds to it feeling different for, you know, Achilles when he's fighting and doing stuff. And I think that's a cool, um, just a great touch of it, right? Of making, of selling that. Anton, I'll give you a, a Marvel mm -hmm. reference. All right, go. Achilles in this movie sort of reminds me of Captain America. Okay. He's just kind of like tearing through everybody. He's a complete wrecking machine. He's just blowing mm -hmm. through people left and right. But it doesn't look stupid. It looks really cool. Yeah, the I think that's where it comes down to a few things. Even if you don't have an idea of who Achilles is or what his character is supposed to be, I think the story sets him up as this is yeah. Achilles, right? Yeah. In a very good way. And so then there's a you already have good buy in and believability as he continues to progress and just, you know, just basically like rip it up. They show and tell in the best way. Yes. I keep thinking about the when he kills Boagrius in the beginning. Like, Nathan, were you expecting some kind of crazy badass fight? No, I just. Yeah, I don't know efficient. what I was expecting from. I mean, I was expecting at least. I don't know what I was expecting, but I think it, they what they did sold it very well. Right. Oh, this is he's different. He's yeah. built different. You know, I still remember 20 years later seeing that in the theater and the entire theater going, oh, <laughs> and so for a moment you were like, oh, maybe this is going to be like really significantly, like consistently good. They set it up, too. If you remember, Nestor tells yeah. him, you remember he doesn't want to fight and Nestor kind of talks to him. He's like, you can end this battle with a single swing of your sword. He wasn't kidding. And he wasn't kidding. I think all the battles in this film are really good. The attack on the yeah. beachhead, great. It, that's That gets really mm -hmm. extended in the director's cut. The big battle in front of Troy where uh, you know Hector fights Ajax and kills him. Again, that's extended in the director's cut. Nathan, mm -hmm. just watch the director's cut. You'll like it. And then the centerpiece of the film, Achilles versus Hector. All-time oh, great movie fight. Oh my gosh, what a great fight. I was, I was anticipating it. Mm -hmm. the whole time tension. i think of that uh, particularly did not disappoint from watching 
really liked it. And a lot of it is because it's set up really well. You know what are the stakes, and each character has their own strengths, especially for Hector versus Achilles. I love Emotion. how they do it. He yeah. Very early in the fight, Achilles goes for his signature move, right? The hop step, jabbing the sword down. You know, we've already seen Achilles do this a couple times, right? So we know it's devastating. Hector just blocks it immediately. It's great, great visual storytelling because you instantly know, and Achilles instantly knows, that Hector is way better than anyone mm-hmm. else he's ever fought before. And the fight lasts about, I believe it's three minutes of screen time, which is the perfect amount. It's not too short. It's not too long. It's not dragged out like that dumb, you know, Anton, you know what I'm going to say, like that dumb over choreographed lightsaber fight in Revenge of the Sith that I'm, I seem to be the only person who doesn't like it. It's a really long, really long lightsaber battle. Oh, you agree with me. Too long. I mean, they're going through everywhere on that planet it's ludicrous it's ludicrous levels of escalation this is how you do a movie fight think like think about the fight in this film there's really no slow motion it's pretty simple there's not much to it if you're giving me a 10 minute fight all i ask is that's jackie chan and all he has is ladders and a pit and a pitcher full of water well that's that's different well, we, that's, we make exceptions that's a different uh, mm-hmm. no i think this is greatly paced and so yeah. yeah. is just a fight just such a great game there did you feel bad for Hector at the end? Uh, yeah. I mean, oh, he's he's like the the goodest guy in this in this movie, and you're like, I guess, and he's like, I guess I'm gonna have to die for a bunch of decisions that really everybody else made. I will say, like Peter O'Toole being like very like, oh, I'm so I'm so proud of you, son, and I'm like, dude, you're you're the one who like did not listen to him, and you are directly responsible for him, like having to go and die for your sake i feel like pedro pascal is going to be a hector type Mm. character in the new gladiator movie you think so i could see that yeah seems like the he's being set up this way really honorable guy but on the wrong side of the army looking for fights in all the wrong places (laughs) when we finally get to the trojan horse i also feel like that was not disappointing I thought it was pretty cool looking. It's original. It looks like something that they would have hastily constructed. Yeah. No, it doesn't. Because if you're going to make a movie about Troy, you you damn well better get the Trojan yeah. horse right. And they did. I think that worked. I liked that it was looked like it was actually constructed from ship parts and not like a car, like a whole carved piece that made sense, right? Rather right. than, oh, where'd they get this random carved horse from? Yeah. You know. Because they could have done You could have done that. No, they could have easily screwed this up, and they didn't. I still think it's kind of amazing to think that this could have been a, co- a coordinated effort to actually design and put together a massive horse. I thought the CGI aged well. There's not an over-reliance on it. Mm-hmm. They use it where they need to. Agree fully. I think I was surprised that wasn't... Uh, that there wasn't any weird CGI choices with it. So it was good. There was no CGI on the extras. That was just a yeah. lot of extras. Yeah. It's what you do. The two shots that stood out to me the most, that real long overhead tracking shot of the two armies mm-hmm. crashing into each other, that's breathtaking. And then the long shot of the Greek army pouring through the Troy city gate, you know, in middle of the night, there's like torches lit. It's pretty awesome. Wolfgang Peterson got all those mm-hmm. dramatic moments right. Oh, yeah. I think great. Yeah, definitely. Those big, the scope and scale of a lot of the fights felt felt right. James Horner score. Let's talk about it. What do we think? I thought it was fine. All right. And I didn't find, I felt it was very inoffensive. I know that in your previous one, uh, the previous pod, and I'm sure still feels the same. I know, Pat, you didn't care too much for the wailing vocalization. I thought it was... Oh, you mean the... the hi, 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 I'm glad. Hi, hi. Yeah, I'm not a fan. That. Yeah, I thought it was fine. I am not offended by anything from the soundtrack, but I'm certainly never going to go and be like, oh, I need to go listen to that again. I think it's just following Eric Bana because it was in this... It was in Black Hawk Down. It was in it was in Hulk. For whatever reason, it was in Hulk. Anton, do you remember on that episode I asked you, because I know nothing about the comics. I was like, oh, there's there's obviously some kind of Middle Eastern connection to the character, right? And you're like, nope. no. Not at all. Nope. <laughs> I suppose it's more appropriate here, but it, it's 
I'm just so glad this is not part of soundtracks anymore because this was such a big trend in the 2000s. It's not one of Horner's better works. And, you know, Horner is a composer who borrowed from himself quite a bit. I, I certainly heard chunks of Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan in this score, but we already touched on this. He was given two weeks to compose the score, and was, eh, I don't think I could compose a score in two decades, so more power to him. Threw something together, it was fine. Yeah. Like I said, you can find the rejected score on YouTube. I, I listened to it. I can see why mm-hmm. they didn't like it. Curiously, I it sounds like one of the rejected tracks is in the film it's like the piece of music that plays during the party in sparta mm-hmm. you know right before paris takes helen upstairs that seems to be one of the tracks that yared composed so i don't know how that works mm. i got oh. some more horner quotes Excellent. for the both we of you enjoyed what, what you had earlier he said here quote when wolfgang asked me to do the film i said but how can you turn down a gabriel gabriel yared score he didn't give me a straight answer it was a very bizarre situation i respect yared deeply and when you start working with a composer as talented as he is you should think twice or even three times before reacting so impulsively harshly and disrespectfully continued i accepted troy because i thought it would be an interesting challenge for me and the people working with me I also said yes because Wolfgang asked me as a favor. Continued, The score doesn't compare particularly well to other scores because of how we got started in the first place. If Troy is a success, it's because of the movie as a total experience, the chemistry between the visuals and the music, but not necessarily because the score can stand on its own two feet, end quote. (laughs) Wow. He's like, yeah, Yeah, this isn't my best work. Oh my gosh, that's funny. What about the song that plays during the end credits sung by Josh Groban? <laughs> what do you think, Anton? Big big fan? Uh, Not on my rotation. Okay. Uh, Nathan, any takers? Similarly, like, okay, that's there. Not, uh, again, not offended by it. Not like, oh, this is a weird or wrong choice. Just, just a song that I guess Josh Groban was hot during that year and years to come. So, cool. Not as good as the end credits song from... Castlevania Symphony of the Night well, that's on the PS1. Really hard to beat. Now, what if they had put that at the end of Troy during the credit? I think that would be amazing. Pat, uh, <laughs> after this recording, definitely look it up. Can it's you text got me to remind me? Oh, yeah. I will I will send it. It's a trip. Well, I'm surprised neither of you have picked up on the connection for the next well, film I, that you're recording. I did pick up on that Nathan. connection. In fact, it was one of the first things that I um, Oh. Actually, before I watched the next film that we're recording, my wife pointed it out and said, hey, there's a connection between these two films. And I'm like, oh, they both came out in 2004. She was like, no, Josh Groban, the synthetic, the connecting tissue between Troy and the yet to be named. Film. Like the wind. Like the wind. Are we going to remember to bring this up on of that course. film's recording? I <laughs> hope. Thank you. Some I, Someone please remember. Uh, but uh, yeah, I kind of like this song and I don't know why, because I think it kind of sucks, yeah. but I like it. It's got a nice melody. I don't even know if this is worth discussing, but does this film get greenlit today? Um, I think so. You don't think so? You do think so? I think it no, gets I do think so. as two to three that are going to be filmed back to back so that they can turn it into more movies. I could see that. And then we they would try to turn it into some kind of uh, Trojan well, cinematic that's a universe. Part, but yeah. I could... I could see it being a film where they attach a famous director in the twilight of his years mm. to direct it. Oh, like uh, and it's, Ridley Scott? Like Ridley, like Ridley Scott. It's happening this yeah. weekend with uh, <laughs> Gladiator 2. Yeah. Is that Just out about. this? Oh, that's... And, oh, okay, that would be, though. Weekend. Yeah. Well, when this episode comes comes out, it will be coming out, yeah. Yeah. It's weird, right? It's like I I almost I wanted to say the sword and sandal genre is once again dead, but it's apparently We're not. I mean, when's the last time we had a film like Gladiator 2? Uh 300? Well, we there was a big resurgence in interest because of the what is it, the different like Rome and Sparta series. Oh, that's true. And we had um so you're, you're talking about the Sparta Kiss series, right? Yeah, Spartacus, yeah. yeah. When was that? Like late 2000s? Yeah, like late 2000s, mm-hmm. early 2010s. Yeah. Rome was a great series on HBO. Unfortunately, it got canceled prematurely, but that was a great series. Yeah, that definitely 
kept a lot of interest. Lucy Lawless, of course, was had a great career resurgence in that genre. Mm, so it seems, it's, it's, it seems yeah, like it, it's on TV. Yeah. I'm expecting Gladiator 2 to be absolutely okay. terrible, just based on you know my opinion of Ridley Scott at this point. It, it ain't great. I mean, it's interesting cast. Denzel, Mandalorian, two smarmy looking twins. Twins? What? Bam. Yeah, the uh, the Roman the the Roman co emperor brothers. Oh yeah, that sounds great. I'm sure I'm gonna see it eventually. Although after Napoleon, Anton, I don't know. Shall we wrap up? Let's shall. All right. Well, Nathan, you know how this works. As the guest, you have the opportunity okay. to go first. I'll take it. So, where do I land on Troy? So I really didn't know much about this film going into it. I knew it existed, but I didn't really know what its reputation was or much about it. I think as uh, as I watched it, I think I was ultimately, I, don't, I know this may sound a bit odd, pleasantly kind of surprised because I was truly expecting something more off-putting for a film that I really just hadn't heard anything about. I don't think it's a movie that ever really rises above anything other than kind of being okay and kind of mediocre, but never in an off-putting way. I think it has good set design. I think the best part about it is the visual design and a lot of the uh, a lot of that is just, I think, fun and enjoyable, bright and colorful. I think there's a lot of interesting choices in terms of uh, acting at different points with the film, but it's it's never... It's never a film that rises above all of its individual parts or really feels like it comes together in a complete way. Um, again, I'm only judging based on the theatrical release, but I'd, I'd give this a C film. I don't think it's super, uh, it's not offensive in any particular, uh, excuse me. <clears throat> it's not offensive in any particular way, but nothing about it. I wouldn't, I'm not a go. I'm not excited to tell people to go watch this movie or really watch it again anytime soon. But I'm holding out hope that the director's cut is everything you guys say it is. I think you'll like it. Yeah, that's it for me. Revisiting the film was fun just because we do get that extra added perspective of Nathan. And unfortunately, I can't add that to my score. Um, but as much as I would love to, I think that would give it so many points. But I feel like looking at this film again, I don't think that there was necessarily anything that kind of gave me a very fresh perspective. I don't think that I looked upon anything much more favorably. I think my perspective is still the same in that this film has some very beautiful elements to it, but overall is very flawed in its ability to balance the characters and motivations together along with a cohesive storyline. It's a very big film, big budget film, big studio film, and unfortunately, I don't think it lives up to the hype, but it is a very fun film, and the fact of it really is the quintessential film to fit under our podcast of why wasn't this film better, and it was really great to be able to revisit those points so definitely. <laughs> so yeah, no, no new score for me. I feel like this is just a C, a very average film with some very memorable elements, but otherwise I think it really could have been a lot better. I too enjoyed revisiting this, Anton. This was a great selection from our patron, Daniel. Troy does not deserve his reputation as a bomb. There's a lot of negative things said about this movie. Some of it is deserved, a lot of it is not. This is not a bad movie. I actually think it's pretty good. It's better than average. I think it's a mistake to compare this to Gladiator, but I think at this point, 20 years on, enough time has passed that most people don't. This is a movie that deserves to be judged on its own. They don't really make these movies anymore, or do they? Because Gladiator 2 is coming out soon. Although Gladiator is quite a different film from this one, even though us and others continue to talk about them in the same sentence. I certainly appreciate this as the throwback to, you know, old school Hollywood that it is. It's very well shot. There's some good performances in it. There's some good writing in it. There's a lot of really well acted scenes that I enjoy. On the other hand, I do think it's fair to call this film disappointing. It's perfect for our podcast. I think it's bloated. There's some awkward pacing and 
a lot of the problems are related to the storytelling. There's some questionably written characters. Brad Pitt is the star, but it's not one of his best performances. Based on the sheer star power involved and the direction of Wolfgang Peterson and the amount of money that they spent to make it, yeah, this should have been better. In fact, we know what it should have been. It should have been what the director's cut was, which was a vast improvement over this theatrical version. It's a better story. It's a more fleshed out story. I would probably rate the director's cut a B. I don't think it's a masterpiece, but I I, I enjoy it so much more than this. Mm. This may bore some of the listeners, but like you, Anton, I stand by the rating that I gave it the first time when we covered it, which was a C plus. I think it's pretty good, but it never elevates itself into the land of great. And that's Troy. Nathan, always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you guys so much. Such a fun conversation about a movie that I agree with Anton just is quintessentially like, why wasn't it better? I enjoyed watching it. I again, it, it in some ways, it definitely exceeded. I think some expectations that I had, where I was really like, ah, I thought I thought there was going to be more of a snoozer. Again, I, it's it's a film that I was like, also wish it was a little bit. I I wish it was kind of better, right? I wish those different pieces came to better. A game came together in a better way. But you know, that's what makes it kind of interesting to talk about. <laughs> well, Nathan. We're having you on Mm -hmm. again very soon. Yeah. And we're excited to talk about that film as well. And I'm just uh, wanted to say thank you. I hope to see you in person soon. Uh, Just because I miss you, bud. Thanks. Look forward to seeing you too. I look forward to seeing both of you in person because Anton, it's been a long time. Nathan, I've never met you in person. It's been a long time. Let's find the exact middle ground where all of us, it's equidistant for all of us. I think somewhere in like Kansas, something like that, right? Is there an app for that equidistant location? Maybe. We can look at it. I'm sure there is. Find it. Um, Can we make it like Chicago or something? Chicago would be fun. Yeah. Um, I'm also open to Denver. Okay. Yeah, perhaps. We'll talk about that offline. I guess before we close, I wanted to offer it up. Nathan, do you want to read our outro? Sure. I'd love to. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please give us a follow and a five-star review. Be sure to check out our YouTube channel as well. As always, you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. For those who would like to support us directly, we have a Patreon. Links are in the description. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Well said. See you you next time, guys. Later. Let's go.